ago when uh, I was in Honduras, I had the opportunity to speak to some uh, elementary uh, children uh, in the elementary school there uh, at the church that I was at. That didn't come out very good. What am I trying to say? They were in elementary school, and they were attending the school at the church where I was being invited to. There we go. Anyway, elementary school children. And, and I, wanted to, uh, I wanted to talk to them about following Jesus, the importance of following him. But now, they spoke Spanish, and I didn't. And uh, I spoke English, and they didn't. So we used an interpreter, obviously. But I also realized that, you know, actions sometimes speak louder than words. And so in talking to them about uh, following Christ, uh, I thought I would just do something with them. So I invited five of the students to come up onto the platform with me. And through the interpreter, I said, now, I want all of you to follow me, okay? And so I lined them up behind me, and I just kind of walked all over the platform and went through the choir loft and all that kind of thing. And they just, they followed right behind me. And so, so then I said, okay, now we're going to reverse the roles. I'm going to follow you all. But then I put a blindfold on, okay? And uh, so I, there I am standing up there, and the, the, I can't see anything. And so I say, okay, boys and girls, I'm going to follow you, so start walking. Of course, I couldn't see anything, and so I started to walk, but, you know, I was walking like this. <laughs> And, uh, you know, before long, I kind of bumped into a few things, and, and the kids real quickly realized that if I was going to be able to follow them, they had to come get me. <laughs> they had to grab me by the hand. And so when they grabbed me by the hand, even though I couldn't really see, I was able to follow them all over the places that they led me. And I'll just say that that was a little bit scary, not too bad, uh, but because uh, I wasn't really sure where they would end up at, but we finally made it up to the top of the platform. And uh, when I took the blindfold off, I, I said, I had them uh, take their seats, and I said to all of those children, I said, I said, I hope you saw that for me to walk around, it was important for them to grab a hold of me. The only way I could follow them is if I was connected to them, if they, were, they had a hold of me. And I said, it's the same way with Jesus. Uh, we can't see Jesus in the same way that I was blindfolded and couldn't see the children. We can't necessarily see Jesus, but we can still follow him if we're connected to him. If we're holding on to him and he's holding on to us. This morning's message is titled Christ Followers. And it's based upon a story in the life of Peter that we find in the book of Acts. So if you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to open your Bibles to this passage of Scripture, Acts the 10th chapter, uh, verses 9 through 48. Uh, verses 9 through 48. I accidentally put the wrong verse up there. So it's Acts the 10th chapter, verses 9 through 48. Now while you're turning there, I don't know if you've noticed it or not, but the phrase Christian has somewhat become a little bit diluted in recent years. Have you noticed that? You know, the word Christian can be used to mean a lot of different things other than what it used to mean. You know, you can use the word Christian to talk about uh, a political or nationalistic uh, group of people. Uh, you can use the word Christian just in general uh, when we describe other folks. In other words, we can say, you know, she's a fine Christian woman or he's a fine Christian man. And especially down here in the South, in the Bible Belt, where everybody's a quote, Christian, it can really just mean people here that live in the South. We're just Christian folk. But you know, the, it really means something more than that. And, and you know, what's happened is that in recent years, people have kind of made the transition from using the word Christian to using the phrase Christ follower. And, and I kind of like the phrase. I don't know about you all, but I do. Because it implies action, doesn't it? Uh, Christian, that's fine. And if we understand what it means, it's, it's good. But you know, Christ follower is a little bit more descriptive, isn't it? It tells what we do. What do we do? We follow Christ, right? This is especially important during a time, a time in which we live, in which the word Christian has lost some of its meaning. When it seems as if there are people who claim that label, they call themselves Christians, but it's obvious by the content of their life that they're following something or someone other than Christ. Listen, we're going to look at a passage of Scripture here, a, a, an event in the life of Peter in which Peter shows very clearly that he was following Christ. It's a great example. I love Peter. He's one of my favorite persons in the New Testament. And I think the reason that I love Peter so much is that I identify with him. Sometimes Peter got it right, but there were a lot of times when Peter was just a bonehead. 
And, and I identify with that because sometimes I get it right, but sometimes I get it wrong and, and I'm just a bonehead. And, and, and I identify with that. This is one of those instances where Peter gets it right in which he follows Christ. But I want to make sure that you know this before we read this long extended passage of Scripture. This is an event where Peter's following Christ, but Christ has already ascended to heaven, okay? So Jesus isn't standing right next to Peter. He's not leading the way. Peter is going to be following Christ in this story that we're going to read, but Jesus isn't standing right there in front of him. So what do we mean by this? We are saying that Peter is following who Jesus is, what Jesus did in his life, all the things that Jesus taught. We're seeing Peter following Christ even though Jesus is not standing physically in front of him. You'll see what I mean when we look at this passage of Scripture. It's a fairly long passage of Scripture. I apologize for reading all of this, but it really is a great story, and we need to hear it in its entirety. So we're going to begin at verse 9 here now in Acts, the 10th chapter. We're going to skip over the first few verses, but you'll know what happens in those first few verses when we get further into the story. The next day, as they were traveling and nearing the city, Peter went up to pray on the housetop at about noon. Then he became hungry and wanted to eat, but while they were preparing something, he went into a visionary state. He saw heaven opened and an object coming down that resembled a large sheet being lowered to the earth by its four corners. In it were all the four-footed animals and reptiles of the earth and the birds of the sky. Then a voice said to him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. No, Lord, Peter said, for I have never eaten anything common and unclean. Again a second time, a voice said to him, What God has made clean you must not call common. This happened three times, and then the object was taken up into heaven. Now, while Peter was deeply perplexed about what the vision he had seen might mean, the men who had been sent by Cornelius, now you'll find out about him in a moment, having asked direction to Simon's house, stood at the gate. They called out, asking if Simon, who was also named Peter, was lodging there. While Peter was thinking about the vision, the Spirit told him, Three men are here looking for you. Get up, go downstairs, and accompany them with no doubts at all, because I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men and said, Here I am, the one you're looking for. What is the reason you're here? They said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who has a good reputation with the whole Jewish nation, was divinely directed by a holy angel to call you to his house and to hear a message from you. Peter then invited them in and gave them lodging. The next day he got up and set out with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa went with him. The following day he entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him, fell at his feet, and worshipped him. But Peter helped him up and said, Stand up. I myself am also a man. While talking with him, he went on in and found that many had come together there. Peter said to them, You know, it's forbidden for a Jewish man to associate with or visit a foreigner. But God has shown me that I must not call any person common or unclean. That's why I came without any objection when I was sent for. So I ask, why did you send me? Cornelius replied, four days ago at this hour at three in the afternoon, I was praying in my house. Just then a man in a dazzling robe stood before me and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your acts of charity have been remembered in God's sight. Therefore, send someone to Joppa and invite Simon here, who is also named Peter. He is lodging in Simon, the tanner's house, by the sea. Therefore, I immediately sent for you and did the right thing, in, and you did the right thing in coming. So we are all present before God to hear everything you've been commanded by the Lord. Then Peter began to speak. In truth, I understand that God doesn't show favoritism, but in every nation the person who he fears him and does righteousness is acceptable to him. He sent the message to the sons of Israel, proclaiming the good news of peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. You know the events that took place throughout all of Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and curing all who were under the tyranny of the devil because God was with him. We ourselves are witnesses of everything he did in both the Judean country and in Jerusalem, yet they killed him by hanging him on a tree. But God raised up this man on the third day and permitted him to be seen, not by all the people, but by us, witnesses appointed beforehand by God, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to solemnly testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that through his name, everyone who believes in him will receive forgiveness of sins. Now, while Peter was still speaking these words, 
the Holy Spirit came down on all those who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speaking in other, in other languages and declaring the greatness of God. Then Peter responded, Can anyone withhold water and prevent these from being baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to stay for a few days. All right, a long passage of Scripture, but it's all being read, and we're looking at this passage of Scripture with one single solitary intent. And it is in the form of a question. We're even going to put it up here on the board here this morning. We, we looked at this passage of Scripture, and this message is, in, is designed to help you answer one very important question. Are you following Christ? Are you following Christ? This particular passage that we read, it, it shows some indicators here that Peter was following Christ. Now, P Jesus wasn't right there in front of him, but he was still following him. And we can see some indications here that Peter was, in fact, doing the very things that God would have him to do. And we're going to look at those indicators here and apply them to our lives as well. Because I'm convinced that as Peter followed Christ, there were some things that he did, some things that he experienced that affirmed that. And I think that, that kind of affirmation can take place here in our lives as well as we compare our lives to this event in the life of Peter. And folks, here's the real upshot of the whole thing. If at the end of our time together, in looking at this passage of Scripture more closely, if you come to the realization that maybe you've claimed the label of Christian, but now God has spoken to you in a very real way today, and he's asking you to follow him. You're going to have an opportunity at the end of our service to make that decision, to follow Christ. And I pray that if God is speaking to you in that way, that you'll follow through and make that decision. Now, as we look at this passage of Scripture, we're seeing that if you follow Jesus, it's going to cause all kinds of things to take place, some different things to take place. So let's look at it from that perspective. What happens when we follow Jesus? We're going to look at Peter's example here. We're going to return to this passage of Scripture. One of the first things we notice here is that following Jesus will take you places you've never been. Following Jesus will take you places that you've never been. I want you to look at verse 25. We're just going to pull a few verses out here in the time remaining and look at them individually. Look at verse 25 there. It says, when Peter entered, Cornelius met him, fell at his feet, and worshipped him. Now, we're not so much concerned about Cornelius meeting him and worshipping as we simply are the fact that it says Peter entered. Now, that seems like a simple statement, but folks, it has huge implications with regards to what it means to follow Christ. You see, Peter had been taught all of his life as a good Jew, do not have any contact with Gentiles. None whatsoever. Un and never under any circumstance should you enter the home of a Gentile. He had been taught that all of his life. And if we look at verse 28, look at verse 28. He supports this. Verse 28, Peter said to them, You know it's forbidden for a Jewish man to associate with or visit a foreigner. But folks, that's just exactly what he just did. He went into this Gentile home. He'd been taught all of his life, don't ever do that. And yet he did it. How do we explain that? Well, Peter was a Christ follower. That's how we explain that. And when you follow Christ, it'll take you places that you've never been. You know, that happens to believers today. That's just not something reserved for Peter. He wasn't a super Christian or a super apostle or anything like that. Peter was a man, as you heard him say, to Cornelius. And it can happen to people like you and me today when we follow Christ. When we follow Christ, it'll take us places that we've never been. And it's not just the geographic places. You know, sometimes when we follow Christ, it takes us to a place outside of our comfort zone. Have you ever heard that phrase used before? Uh, that is a place. Uh, when we follow Christ, it'll lead us to the unknown, the unfamiliar that can happen if we truly accept the risk and follow Christ. Hey, guys, you remember the story in the New Testament where the 12 apostles were in a boat out on the sea and a big storm came up and they thought they were going to sink and Jesus is on the shore and he sees that they're in distress and Jesus walks out on the water to them. Do you remember that story? And when they see Jesus, they all say, it's a ghost. And Jesus says, no, I'm not a ghost. It's me, guys. 
And Peter says, if it's really you, then command me to walk on the water. And Jesus said, come. And Peter swung his legs over the side of that boat, and he started walking on the water. You talk about going to a place you'd never been before. Now, I know some of you are saying, but now, preacher, read the rest of the story. He took a few steps, and then he looked at the waves, and he looked at the wind, and he got scared, and he started to sink, and Jesus had to save him. He was about to drown. Preacher, didn't, didn't he fail? You know, Peter may have faltered a little bit, but I'll tell you who the failures were. The other 11 men in the boat. Because they said, yeah, that's Jesus, but I'm going to stay right here where it's nice and safe in this boat. It's riskier if we walk out to him. Listen, folks. Following Jesus involves risk. But you know, if we're willing to take that risk, Following Jesus will take us to places that we've never been before. I want to ask you a question, and it's a compelling question, one I want you to consider here just for a few moments. Has your faith in Jesus Christ ever propelled you to go somewhere that you would not have gone had you not been a Christian, a Christ follower? Have you found yourself going someplace simply because you're a believer in Jesus Christ? It's a place that you wouldn't have gone without your faith in Jesus Christ? And I'm just not talking about a geographical place. Have you ever found yourself in the role of at work or at school where you're there to simply listen to someone who's having a difficult day? You're there to communicate Christian sympathy and warmth towards that person? It may be that God put you in that place and you'd never been there before. But you were there because you were following Christ. Following Jesus will take us places we've never been. Here's something else that will happen. Following Jesus will allow you to do things you've never done. Look at verse 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came down on all those who heard the message. Now, to make sure we see what's happening there, Peter's preaching. You you heard the message. We read it. And when the people heard it, it says the Holy Spirit came down on all those who heard that message. Now, So Peter was preaching the gospel, and the people responded to the gospel. Now, let's be clear. This was not the first time that Peter had ever preached. This was not the first time that people had responded when Peter had preached about Jesus. But it was the first time that the Holy Spirit came down on a group of Gentiles, and they, in a large number, came to know Jesus Christ. I hope you know, and maybe you don't, but I'll remind you, but, you know, early on in Christianity, people, right after Jesus ascended, you know, to heaven and the the apostles and the believers were telling other people about Jesus, the, the people who first came to know Jesus, by and large, were Jews. Mainly, it was just Jews who were making decisions to trust Christ. And after a a, a number of years, it became almost kind of evident to those individuals that this new thing that God had done through Jesus Christ was just for Jews. Keep your place right here, but I want you to move over to chapter 11. Look at chapter 11, verses 2 and 3. Now, this is after this whole thing with Cornelius, and he's, and, and he's gone to Jerusalem. Verse 2, when Peter went up to Jerusalem, those who stressed circumcision argued with him, saying, You visited uncircumcised men and ate with them. And, and they had heard, look, look at verse 1, the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had welcomed God's message also. And they were disturbed about that. Peter knew this. Peter knew that early on, most if not all converts were Jewish people. He knew that His other brothers understood that this was mainly for the Jews. God was doing something again new in the life of the Jews. Yet when God told him to go to Cornelius' house, he went. Why did he do that if he knew all that? It's pretty simple. Peter was a Christ follower. And when you follow Christ, it allows you to do some things that you've never done before. It happens to followers today. If we truly follow Christ, 
that's going to lead us or allow us to do things that perhaps we've never even considered. And you know what, folks? Uh, we really need to see that as kind of the norm of what it means to be a follower of Christ, to be a Christian. I I'm pretty much convinced that if you're truly a follower of Christ, on a regular basis, he'll ask you to do things that you've never done before, probably. And it's also an indication of a right theology. You know, stay with me on this. I I'm convinced and believe that we understand largely our relationship with Christ through the lens of service. In other words, we we've surrender our lives to Christ, and we say, now, Christ, I'm going to serve you. Jesus, you're my Lord and master, and I'm going to serve you. And that's right, and that's good. We need to think in those kinds of terms. But, you know, sometimes we don't progress to the next level of that. Uh, let me describe what I, I mean. It's great and it's good for us to say, Lord Jesus, I love you and I want to serve you, so I'm going to find a way that I can serve you. And we find a way to serve Christ, and that's great and that's right and that's good. But you know what is a little bit better than that? What, what helps us to mature as a believer in Christ? It's when we get to that point when we say, Lord Jesus, you're my Lord and Savior and Master, and whatever you choose, I'll do. Do you see the difference? You see, it's great for us to say, Lord, I'm going to serve you in this way, and I'm going to pick it out. I'm going to choose it. And that's great, and that's good. But it's a sign of Christian maturity. When we get to the place where we say, now, Lord, from now on, instead of me choosing how I'm going to serve you, Lord, I'm just going to say, I'm an open book. I I'm all yours. You tell me how you want me to serve you, and I'll do it, even if it means doing something that I've never done before. Because that's, what's happens. That, that's, that's what happens when you follow Christ. He allows you to do things that you've never done before. Let me ask you a question. I want you to think about it just for a few moments. As a believer, has your faith in Christ put you in a position where you've had to do things that you've never done before? If great, praise the Lord. That's wonderful. But if not, if you're here this morning and you're saying, yeah, I'm a believer, but you've never allowed following Christ to lead to that place where you're in a position to do something that you've never done before, I think you need to ask yourself the question, am I truly following Christ? Because I'm convinced that what we're seeing here in this passage of Scripture is true, not only for Peter, but for all of us. If we follow Christ, it's going to allow us to do some things that we've never done before. Here's a final one here in this passage of Scripture. Following Jesus will lead you to love people you've never loved. Following Jesus will lead you to love people that you've never loved before. Look at verse 48. It's at the very end of the story there. Verse 48. It says, And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and they asked him to stay for a few days. Now, what I want us to focus on there is that request for Peter to stay for a few days. Now, there's the request. They're saying to Peter, Peter, stay with us. Now, it doesn't say that he stayed with them right then, but again, let's look at chapter 11. Just skip down a couple of verses from where you're at right there. What was it that the Gentiles, uh, what was it that the uh, Jews uh, accused Peter of? Verse 2, when Peter went up to Jerusalem, those who stressed circumcision argued with him, saying, you visited uncircumcised men and ate with them. It doesn't say it explicitly, but that seems to imply that when they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days, he must have done that. Or else these folks in Jerusalem wouldn't have been so upset with him. Now, why is that important? It's important simply because of what we've already said. Peter had been taught all of his life, no contact with Gentiles. Don't dare go into their home. And now... He's not only in their home, but he's eating with them. Obviously, they prepared a room for him to stay. Folks, there wasn't a Holiday Inn down there. He didn't take the 21st century approach to ministry and say, I'll breeze in and do a Bible study for an hour, but then when it's over, I'm going back to the Holiday Inn and relax. No, he was there in their midst. He was with them, eating with them, sleeping in a place that they had provided, doing life with them. Folks, all of that says one thing. He was expressing love to them. Make no mistake, love is not so much a feeling from a biblical perspective as it is an attitude, doing what is best for another person. And when Peter stayed with them, he was loving them. 
loving them to the extent that I'm convinced that while he was with them, he told them stories about Jesus. He told them some things that he had witnessed as an eyewitness of what Jesus had done. He was not only concerned about their spiritual well-being and knowing Christ, but in growing in Christ. And so he loved people that he had never seen before. That happens to followers today. I mean, if you're really a Christ follower, God's going to put you in a position to love on folks that you've never loved before. Earlier this year, God led me to speak to you all as a church regarding the property that we own and how perhaps God may be leading us to utilize that property with regards to recreational ministry. And I don't know if that's the the course that we're going to go down. We're going to have a committee that's going to help us, and we're still seeking God's will. But, folks, if we go down that path, if we build some kind of facility out there that allows us to do upward basketball and upward soccer and and upward cheerleading and and, uh, just using that facility to bring people in, through recreation but while they're there give them the gospel if we go down that road i want to make sure that we all understand something god's going to lead people to us that are different from us they're going to be from a different state and you know what god wants us to do with those folks he wants us to love them we may have some florida gator fans come through we got to love them anyway Sorry. Okay, Alabama, Crimson Tide. We've got to love them too. They're, they're going to have a different skin color. They're going to be from a different part of the country. And listen, most importantly, if, if we are opening a facility up and saying, come be a part of this, but we're doing it in such a fashion where we're proclaiming the gospel to them, and that's what we have to do. But listen, folks, Jesus has at zero concern in helping someone come to be a better basketball player or soccer player, but he is 100% committed to helping a person come to know him personally. Amen? He proved that on the cross. That's about as committed as you can be. And we're not committed to helping people become better soccer players or basketball players, but we're going to use that perhaps in a way to present the gospel to them. So that through that, they come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But listen, when they first show up, they're going to be lost. They're probably going to use language they ought not use. They're going to have ideas that we won't agree with. But listen, why should we expect anything different? Lost people act like lost people. What does God want us to do when we come in contact with them? Love them. Don't miss the fact that Peter stayed with them a few days. You know what we have a tendency to do in our day and time as churches when it comes to ministry? We, we try and do that disinfected kind of ministry. You know what I'm saying? You know, we want to help people, but we don't, don't want to get our hands dirty. We, we don't, we're, we're committed to helping people, but we're only committed just so far. You know what, folks, for us to truly love on lost people, we're going to have to get to know them, get to know what their name is first and last, get to know what their family's like, get to know what's going on in their lives, get to know where they work or where they go to school. We're going to have to do some things. We're going to have to get involved if we're going to be able to love on them in the capacity that God wants us to do that so that they can come to know Christ. But listen, that's what Christ followers do. Amen? If you're following Christ, that's what you'll do. Now, if you're following something else, or someone else, you'll find an excuse. I want to just ask you a simple question here, something to ponder just for a few moments. Has God ever placed someone in your path and told you to love on them i'm not talking about putting an engagement ring on their finger and marrying them or anything like that i'm talking about has has, has, where where you work where you go to school in your family in your neighbor neighborhood has god ever just put a person in your path and you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that they're there because god wants you to express love to them 
and show them the love of Christ. Listen, if that's happened in your life, praise the Lord, hallelujah. If you've recognized that and you've done your best to love on them, the result doesn't matter. We, we do the love, and God is the one who does the results, right? He's in charge of the results, the, 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 the work uh, results. But listen, if you've never found yourself in a position where God is attempting to break down the barriers that you've erected between you and other groups of people, if you've never sensed God saying to you, you're allowing the worldly view of love and the worldly view of yourself to keep what I've given to you to yourself, if God has never said it's time to break down the barriers and begin to embrace people different from you, my fear is that perhaps you're not following Christ in that particular area of your life. I realize that somebody may be here this morning and say, okay, Brother Robbie, all of that makes sense. Peter followed Christ. We get it. But do I have to follow Christ? Just because Peter followed Christ, does that mean I'm supposed to follow Christ? What's the big deal? I'm going to give you an answer, and and when I give it to you, you're going to say, Brother Robbie, you worked long and hard on that difficult, hard answer. You're just going to be so impressed. Why follow Christ? Because the road you're on determines your destination. Well, that was deep, wasn't it? I can't even claim that. People have said that. Other preachers have said that before I have. Why should you follow Christ? Because the road that you're on determines what your destination will be. Folks, if I go out and get on 75 South and just keep on that road and stay on that road, eventually I'm going to be in Florida, heaven forbid. I mean, uh, I'm not trying to beat up on Florida. I'm sorry about that. But if I follow that road, that's where I'm going to end up. The road you're on determines your destination. Now, some of you are here today, and you're following something or someone. In fact, everybody follows something or someone. Everybody does. Everybody has a road. Everybody has a path that they're on. And it's important for you to know that whatever road that is, it will lead to a specific destination. So regardless if you're here today and you're following your own selfish desires, in other words, everything that you do is, is, is around you, the world revol- revolves around you, the only thing that matters is you being happy and satisfied. If you're following that road, it will lead to a predictable destination, and I'll tell you what that is in just a few moments. If you're on the road in which you are being influenced and propelled by your peers, by your friends in school or in your family, if you're allowing what other people think and do and believe to cause you to go down a particular path it leads to a predictable destination and i'm going to tell you what that is in just a few moments if you're simply living a life that is attracted to the worldly allure of of sin that's out there if you're saying whatever the world can give me i'm here to get it and i'm going to do as much as i possibly can in the time that i have left you're on a particular road and it leads to a particular destination what do all of those lead to they lead to death they lead to destruction The Bible tells us that if we die without Christ in our lives physically, when we die physically, then we will also experience spiritual death, cut off from Him, suffering for all of eternity in a place called hell. But if you choose the road or the way that is Jesus, it leads to a specific destination. And that destination is eternal life. Why should you follow Christ? Because he's the only one that can lead you in the way that's right for you. Perhaps today, you need to change the path that you're on or the road that you're on. And we want to give you an opportunity to do that. Let's stand together right now. We're going to have an invitation here in just a moment. It's an invitation that is aimed at saying to you personally, if God has spoken to you about the road that you're on and you realize that it's time for you to switch, to get on the right road, now's your opportunity to do that. Now, it's not about joining a church. It's not about getting uh, some of the bad habits out of your life. What we're talking about here is saying in your heart, sincerely to the Lord and Master and Savior of the world, I am a failure. I am a sinner. 
And I'm asking you to be merciful to me. I confess my sin and repent of that sin and ask you to enter into my life to be my Lord and Master and Savior and saying to him, from this point on, I'm going to live for you. Now, folks, we won't do that perfectly. But when we surrender our lives to Christ, a spiritual transformation takes place. Jesus takes up residence in our lives, and our want to is changed. We want to please Christ. We want to follow him. And we're asking you this morning, has God impressed upon you to make that kind of decision here today? Now, it could be you've already come to know Christ and you already know him. But God has convicted you about your level of fellowship. Not fellowship, but fellowship. Are you truly following Christ? Or are you following other things in this life? Listen, when we follow Christ, it's going to take us places we've never been, allow us to do things that we've never done. We're going to love people that we've never loved before. Are those things present in your life? Or do you just kind of keep to yourself and take the back roads? I want to encourage you to follow Christ here this morning. Maybe you've already made that commitment to follow Christ, and this is the church that God wants you to be a part of. You want to join this church. We invite you to come forward. If you need to come to this altar and simply pray and ask the Lord to give you strength and courage to follow him in the week ahead, do that. We're just asking that you respond in whatever way the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now. Steve, come and lead us in this invitation hymn, and as God is speaking to you, and as we sing, you come. sing just one more verse if no one comes it's going to close our invitation if God's speaking to you this morning we're asking you to come forward make that decision